Okay, today we are talking about virtual reality and the future of virtual reality and some exciting applications of VR. And to do this, I am joined by Steve Zhao, who is the CEO of Sandbox. Hi, Steve. How are you, Bernard? I'm very good, very good. So you're joining us from Hong Kong today, which is midnight there, your time at the moment, right? 30 minutes to midnight. Yeah, wow. Wow, I really appreciate you staying up late. <laughs> no worries. Um, so tell us a little bit more about yourself, what you do, and about Sandbox. So I've been uh, developing games uh, pretty much all my life. I started when I was 13 years old. Uh, built my first professional game in university uh, back in the U.S. And um, my first company was a gaming company where we made PC and mobile games. Hmm. And that uh, pretty much ended around 2014 uh, when we tried to enter the mobile space, but it was just very difficult for us. But around that same time, um, that's when VR really picked up. So, um, you know, in early 2016, um, I started what is now today known as Sandbox VR. So in the beginning, uh, it, was, uh, it was a startup pretty much funded by me and my friends. It was to develop uh, games you know, for the uh, VR headsets, namely the Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. Um, but, you know, during our development, we actually realized that um, to create the, what we felt like the most inversive VR um, wasn't just uh, strictly inside the headset, that it needed other technology around it. So we actually thought that the best outcome was actually to build a retail store. Um, it, it was such a far off bet, but we, we used some, um, the experience as a driving point. It's like if we work backwards and said, you know, what does it take to create the best, uh, uh, pretty much a VR experience possible? Um, you know, we realized that beyond just a headset, you need to be together with a group of friends. You have to be fully tracked from uh, head to toe. And we realized that you can't do that inside a home. So uh, we had an open shop. It was the last thing we wanted to do but I think it was the best thing that we could do to create the best, what we felt like the best VR experience possible. Very good. This is, is fascinating. So tell us a little bit more about those experiences then and, and what people can, can expect. So how, how do you, how have you created this more immersive environment? So you do full body VR. What does that mean? So what that means is, um, you know, once you go to a sandbox store, uh, you know, we put headsets on you, you wear these um, VR backpacks and we use um, motion capture cameras within the room to track you. Now, all of this are hardware you can just buy off the shelf, you know, but what we've really done was we built a software architecture to allow a group of friends, namely a group of six folks to play within a very confined environment. So once they strap on the headset, the, you know, all the gears and they're inside VR, like, um, the hands are tracked, the fingers are tracked, the legs are tracked. It's almost like a one-to-one -one movement. So in a sense, it's almost like a minimal viable matrix or a minimal viable holodeck. It almost feels like uh, it's real life because you know, as a player, when you look at your friends, you literally can high five your friend, you can hug your friend, you can kick your friend. And what that does is you start to forget that you're inside a simulation and this world to you becomes real. So, you know, we spent an inordinate amount of time to create that technology to do that. And then um, we also have a team that actually build uh, our experiences internally uh, because our DNA has been uh, developing games. This is very natural to us, but, you know, um, we're developing games um, on a platform that we created. So we really utilize like all the, um, all the methods that we created where you're required to like interact with your friends. So you had to put your uh, hands on your friend's shoulder to save them. There are instances where, you know, um, you have to like, um, you know, physically help your friend out. So, you know, what that does is the outcome is um, you believe in the world, it's very real. And in order to progress in that world, you and your friends have to communicate and work together. And um, we have, one of the best ways to describe it is like you and your friends are the stars inside your own movies. And that's basically what we created. Very good. So what sort of experiences, what a summary of some of the key games and, and experiences people can have? 
So we have uh, five pieces of content. Uh, we started with um, Deadwood Mansion, which is a zombie experience. Um, it's not just about shooting zombies. Um, you will see like rats running, crawling on you. You can just brush them off. You can shoot them off of your friend's body. Um, there are like traps inside this like uh, like this like um, mansion. So just lasers, you have to be able to dodge it, tell your friend to move away. There's some zombies that would incapacitate your friend, so you would have to help them um, in certain ways. Uh, so that's kind of like the, the horror intense uh, experience, and people love that. We also created one where it's called Amber Sky. It takes you all the way up to the space. You're on a space elevator, and you go all the way up to the space station, and you have to fight off zombie, uh, sorry, aliens. And then you have another one where um, you're on a like cursed pirate ship to find a treasure. And this is more like a teamwork puzzle-based experience. So you have to work together to figure out how you want to navigate that story. And we also work with CBS Viacom on the Star Trek Discovery IP. So we put you in that world and there's fantasy moments that you would see in a TV show or that you would see in the broader Star Trek universe that you get to do inside a sandbox. And then our fifth experience is a eSport experience where you get to fight your friends with like digital weapons. Very good. So do you envisage a world where you will roll out more of those physical studios or do you think that at some point in the future we will have those experiences from home where people have some of this technology in their home so you can have a similar experience without having to go to physical locations? So definitely our strategy is to roll these locations out. Um, you know, we currently have 12 locations worldwide. Obviously, uh, with the pandemic going on, it has been extremely difficult, not just for us, but for, you know, any retailers, especially if it's experiential. But, you know, for us, you know, one of the um, questions that we ask ourselves, like, hey, can you actually put this inside your home? You know, is this kind of like um, a movie experience where eventually you can stream it in front of your TV? Um, you know, if our product is like the holodeck, you can't really just hang the holodeck on your wall. Um, even if the technology decreases in price over time and, and technology improves over time, but the size of someone's home actually gets smaller over time, you know, as folks kind of congregate to the cities and, and such. So we don't think this experience can be replicated, uh, at least that social experience where you have a group of friends play together, where it's full, full body tracking. And not only that, we utilize um, any type of immersive technology to increase immersion. For example, you would wear these haptic vests with like over 40 points of haptic feedback. So when a zombie scratches you, you will feel that scratch in that direction. And that's just a start, you know, for us, we want to create other tools and other haptic uh, technology to really immerse experience. And you cannot just really get that efficiently at home. Pretty cool. So um, looking at the VR space more wide, widely then, um, what do you see as some of the, the most promising applications of virtual reality? So when I think about VR, you know, we also think about like AR, like, you know, what are the applications of both? So uh, VR is definitely, you know, what I focus on, but just high level, I think of AI is kind of like enhancing real life. Um, so, you know, application enhanced real life, you can imagine can work really well for education, for training. Um, but when I think about VR, um, you're basically replacing the whole image with something else. So what that does is it's more like escapism. So um, in terms of that, it works really well with anything where people, for, for entertainment, you know, whether it's for like a VR concert or for us, basically VR games. And if you look at uh, some of the most popular apps on say, like Oculus headset or, or the Vive headsets, they're pretty much dominated by uh, gaming titles right now. So entertainment is just this huge factor for VR. And it's great because VR is this brand new medium. And there's a lot of experiences or games that can be done in VR that you wouldn't get the same experience if it was like on console, uh, PC, or even on mobile. So what are some of your favorite examples of VR in, in entertainment and gaming? I would say um, one game that got it really right is uh, it's called Beat Saber. Um, and what Beat Saber is, if someone has ever played um, Guitar Hero, it is a, a rhythm-based game that is, you know, pretty competitive when you play against the music. But for Beat Saber, it's just um, as a player, instead of like holding guitar, 
you hold two joystick and you swing these sabers to hit these notes. And the reason why it's such a great game is because the navigation, the control is very fluid, it's very natural, it's meant for VR. The way you hold a controller feels very natural, it's like holding swords. And second, it's just a very well-designed, very well-polished experience. And third is the uh, social community aspects of it, where um, you know people would actually perform these um, notes. It's not just about getting the high score, it's just actually a performance art. Where people would, um, you know, do these performed and they put it on YouTube, and it would be like millions of views, and people would talk about it. Like that is how what VR is. It's just so compelling that, you know, your body becomes a control, and you can show it as a, as almost like an art. Very good, and yeah, I I see huge possibilities in sports as well, and entertainment, music, concerts, sport, watching sports. Um, do, do you see that too? One of the reasons we've, um, you know, we're pretty fortunate to have gotten um, investors to put, uh, to invest in Sandbox, um, you know, uh, from, you know, sports athletes like Kevin Durant or uh, musicians like Katy Perry is because we really believe that VR is this artistic medium mm -hmm. for uh, storytelling, uh, for sports, um, you know, for, for uh, music, for art. And, you know, VR is just such a new technology that we're kind of at the beginning of it. I think as the years progress and more will be invented that we can start finding more application and more and more, you know, fluid application for, you know, these type of mediums. Yeah, and I, I think I, I've just finished my, my, my latest book that will come out next year on extended reality. And um, for, for me, this is just the next big trend that is about to take off. Um, and we'll see augmented reality, virtual reality very quickly following along. Um, what do you see as some of the key enablers or barriers of actually making VR and AR more mainstream? I think for VR, at least for home consumer VR, one of the challenges is actually competition with other things you can do at home. So when I'm at home, I can, you know, watch Netflix, I can play on my PlayStation 4, I can play on my laptop, or, you know, I can put on a, a VR headset and play VR. But there's uh, intrinsically a huge friction of use for VR. Um, and of course, we've seen that being improved, but at the first generation, the VR headsets kind of tethered to a computer. There needs to be some setup and calibration that's needed. So the friction of use actually creates a high level of churn. So uh, making it very hard to adopt VR. And you combine that with not having a, a huge, uh, you know, a category of titles to play that it becomes less compelling overall to play VR. But, you know, lately the newest generation of headsets, they're on one headsets where there's no longer tethered to wire. It's very easy to turn, you know, to the lower friction of use. So you do see that improve, but I feel like it's pretty incremental. I, I think the biggest, uh, breakthrough would come from eventually the catalog of you know uh, applications and games available where you know uh, consumers will be like well i really got to play this because there's nothing like this you know in other form factors yeah very good do, do, you, do you envisage a world where we will do social media in in vr at some point i i guess um, companies like Facebook are, are betting on this, creating a, their, their, their horizon platform where their, their vision is that we will just stick on our, our VR goggles and then meet up in, in virtual reality rather than on a, on a two-dimensional screen. Do, do you see that? I think if that you know is to work out, it has to be done in a way that um, it is not incrementally better than anything that we have currently right now. It has to have experience as 10x that you can do in VR to justify that. So until they figure that out, um, you know, it will be hard for someone to transition to that medium or motivated to transition to that medium. Very good. I mean, you, you you are close to the industry. You see some of the trends, some of the development. Um, you you you're already using haptic vests. Um, what other things do you see on the horizon that, that really excites you? Um, you? You've talked about this incremental evolution. Do, do you see anything that, that could take us beyond that? 
Well, for us, um, you know, haptic is kind of the starting point. There are controllers that we we work with with another team that can actually create frictions. So, you know, what would it what it means to um, use telekinesis, right? As a so we were able to work with a partner with a controller to retest that out, or what would it mean to hold a sword and to swing it against a, a physical object and feel that force on your hand? So those are just just very incremental things that you know we're looking into. But when I think about creating immersive experience, it, it's not usually one or two big things. Sometimes it's a, a lot of little incremental things that can actually make the whole experience very real. So it, it is that combination that we're very excited that over time we can find different ways to incrementally uh, make a play a few more immersed in the world. So do, do you see other sensors coming in, things like sensors, sensors of smell, for example, and, and others? We did look into it. Um, for us, um, I do think as humans, there are certain senses that we're very sensitive to, and probably we should double down on those. And there's other senses that, you know, um, it would be less impactful. So that that's one thing we see, you know, smell is something harder to implement right. So for us, there has to be a level of um, uh, application and execution on top of like the functionality for us to justify putting into our product. But, you know, for us is um, when it comes to Sandbox, the biggest thing that we care about is that social element. What do you get to do with your friends, right? And so and for us, um, that smell is secondary to what you can do socially with your friends. So we really want to, want to focus on that too, first. It's that interaction between friends rather than trying to, you know, work on other things that might not relate to that in its entirety. Very good. So what what are your what if if you try to paint your picture of where you see VR and 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 AR and, and extended reality in general going over the next few years, what what do you see on the horizon in terms of how how the the industry will change? Well, definitely, I could speak about VR. Um, you know, I think the industry for VR is getting. Um, I would say a lot more convenient in the sense that the friction of use has become lower, um, which allows for further adoption of these devices. And you know what that also does is uh, the friction of use is lower. You're not tethered to wire. That also increases. Uh, uh, it broadens the type of experiences that can be created. You know when you're tethered to wire, you know experiences are pretty immobile in order to work. But now. With that, along with in better inside out tracking, you can actually create experiences that encourages more movement and that encourages, uh, you know, a rich variety of like other type of experiences that can be developed. So that's really interesting for us. Very good. What What's your prediction by when will VR become real mainstream? I think that's a really tricky question. Um, you know, I think there there are really interesting things that's being developed right now. Um, you know, there's definitely a higher adoption rates. Um, but even for VR, like for us, you know, there's a home consumer, there's also out of home. You know, we do see folks, uh, you know, be incentivized to um, at least to go out their home to do social experiences. And, you know, what the pandemic has done actually probably create this like pent up demand that whenever it's safe, like folks will go back out again and they'll they'll just make up the time difference and try to do more experiences with their friends and family in a safe environment um, for something that's very social. And hopefully Sandbox will be one of those, uh, you know, places for them to spend their time. Very good. That's a great point to, to end. Hopefully, I, I agree, we'll hopefully go back to a world where we can all get together and then experience VR in, in the sandbox. That would be pretty epic. Awesome. Thanks Very good. Thank you so much, Steve. Take care. Take care.